I do want to welcome you to the Northside Neighborhoods for Organized Development uh, Meet the Mayor uh, Forum. And uh, uh, we had uh, three candidates scheduled. Uh, one of the, the candidates uh, will not be here until the, the uh, uh, following the, the formal session, the, the follow-up session. Mr. Medina will be here, and you'll be able to speak with him from 8.30 to 9 o'clock if you want to stay for that. Um, Mayor Taylor, we're so happy to have you here with us this evening. And we're, I've spoken with her, and we've decided that we're going to take and, and go ahead and begin. She has other commitments that she needs to make. And uh, so with that, uh, Mr. Uh, Nuremberg, Councilman Nuremberg, will be here, and, and we'll uh, interject him into the, the process uh, once he arrives. Um, I, he's apparently had a conflict. Um, the procedure that we will use are that candidates will speak in the order they're listed, one, at this point in time. <laughs> but it would, it would be Ms. Taylor because she's the first one that appears on the ballot. Uh, not so significant here tonight, but when you go to the ballot many times, it's hard to find the candidate you want to vote for on the ballot, particularly when there's like 14 for mayor. Uh, fortunately, she's at the top of the list, so she will not be hard to, to identify. But when we were doing the councils last month, uh, that, that was a very uh, revealing situation. Uh, questions have been solicited from the odd members in advance, and uh, they will be asked first in priority. We have asked uh, those of you here to, to complete questions if you want to, for those odd members and non odd members. Uh, we need to turn those in at, at this point in time, and uh, uh, we'll take in and, and see that they're considered. A lot of them uh, that are, we're getting are being consolidated with other comments because of the ones that we've received from the email uh, process to begin with. Uh, candidates will be allowed to introduce themselves, or the one candidate will be allowed to introduce herself, and uh, we'll have four minutes to do that. And then questions will be asked, and there will be a three-minute time limit on the questions. And uh, if we're not going to hold too tightly to the three minutes, because uh, at this point in time, why uh, Mayor Taylor is the only one present. Um, questions will be asked of each and, 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 and candidates will each have uh, four minutes for closing remarks. Out of courtesy to the candidates, we ask that you refrain from talking during their comments. After the candidates have spoken, they will be available. Of course, Mayor Taylor has been here available beforehand, but uh, the others will be available here afterward uh, to talk to you. Uh, that should be in the period of 8.30 to 9 o'clock. At 9 o'clock, we must exit uh, the building, and uh, we uh, invite you to, uh, to those tables and also to a, a couple of other tables. We have a, a table at the, the back of the room, which has, uh, you can find out, not membership over here. So, well, I would be over at the 1SA table to answer questions about the bond program, should you have any. Uh, we have yard signs available. We will pay the Animal Community College District is, is in the back, and she can answer uh, the questions relative to their bond program. Uh, the, uh, uh, we also have at the back uh, now cast San Antonio, and she has uh, a neighborhood diversity yard sign that some of you might be interested in obtaining. So you might want to stop by her table. So with, with that, uh, let's begin. And uh, I, if you would be willing to share with us, Mayor Taylor, uh, some comments. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for being here, taking time out of your schedules. It has been a privilege and an honor for me to serve as your mayor for almost three years now. Uh, I appreciate uh, the partnership with neighborhood associations, so I want to thank you all for the work that you all do every day uh, to uh, maintain and improve quality of life where you live. For my entire professional career in San Antonio, uh, since 1998, I've been working to connect San Antonio families to opportunity while I've been building a life with my husband, Rob.
Rodney and our daughter Morgan, who is 13 years old, and Moody, as I was commenting to someone in the back who also has a 13 year old. But in any case, I'm going to show her out of her moodiness. And I want the San Antonio of tomorrow to be a city where Morgan and all of our children can thrive and they can build productive lives. It is an exciting time in San Antonio right now. We're a 21st century city where anyone can have the opportunities to succeed, to start a business, to build a home and family and improve their education and lives. I think many of you have heard me talk about my vision for San Antonio, that we're a globally competitive city where every single resident, no matter where they live in our community, is connected to opportunities for prosperity. To make that vision a reality, we have some work to do in closing some of the gaps and getting our basics right. You might remember that when I entered the mayor's office back in 2014, we had some big problems that needed our attention. We had a city divided over a streetcar project, police union refusing to negotiate on a contract, and we were uncertain about our city's water uh, supply for the future. Working together with my leadership, we've been able to address each of those issues in a very significant way. These basic issues, transparency, accountability, sensible investments in public safety, transportation, and utilities, those are my priorities. I believe that through planning for the future that we can reduce congestion, keep our taxes low, and preserve quality of life in our neighborhoods throughout San Antonio. I focus on those basics as your mayor, investing in our streets, drainage parks, libraries, and senior centers. And so I'm asking for your support to allow me to continue you to provide that strong leadership. I come to you very prepared for the job uh, as an urban planner uh, who spent six years as a city employee, so I've been behind the scenes and I've seen the nuts and bolts behind the scenes. I've uh, served as a city employee, worked at a nonprofit affordable housing provider, and also was a lecturer at UTSA engaging with our young people as they look to plan their futures served as a council member for five years and now for mayor as mayor for almost three years. So I uh, certainly come to you well prepared and have the experience to uh, continue providing that great leadership for our community. I also believe that I have the, the temperament and focus on bringing people with uh, different views together from around town so that we can all work towards achieving that vision of our city. So again, I thank you all for your time and attention and look forward to the questions and the dialogue. We, uh, uh, we've just begun. Uh, you have uh, four minutes to uh, introduce yourself. Great. Uh, well, thank you all for having me this evening. Uh, my name is Ron Nuremberg. Most important thing about me that you should know is that I'm the very proud father of an eight-year-old son named Jonah, and also the very proud husband of Erica Prosper, who herself is a community servant and a business leader. She'll be the 2018 chairwoman of the board of the Hispanic Chamber. Uh, you know me, we've worked together for the last four years. I've been your city councilman in District 8, which is one of the fastest growing places in the entire city, if not the, tip of the state. It's also the place where the diversity most closely matches the, the diversity of our city as a whole, from socioeconomics to demographics to politics. Um, I have enjoyed every moment of it, uh, and it has been the honor and privilege of my life to serve. As you know, District 8 is full of big issues, from growth to transportation to water security. Uh, and I have worked around the city uh, with many different people, from civic leaders to business leaders and community leaders and neighbors. Uh, and they're all saying the same thing about our city, is that we're doing all right. We're doing just OK. In my opinion, for do doing just OK is not good enough for the city of San Antonio, especially when you consider that the demographic reality is that we will be a, the size of Chicago population-wise within the next 35 years. Status quo has resulted in several challenges that are really important for our city to address. One, our violent crime rate is at the highest point it's been in three decades. Two, we have made no forward progress on truly building a modern transportation system for the city of San Antonio. Three, we have seen our wages, wage growth slow to the point where our affordability gap is widened where the, the average San Antonio family can no longer afford the average home in San Antonio. When you think about it, doing just okay is not doing very well at all. And I think you deserve a better city than that. 
a city that is fiscally responsible with your tax dollars, a city where you feel safe from the fear of violent crime in your neighborhoods and on your streets and in any public places, a city that has a booming economy that's creating great paying jobs in all sectors for all San Antonians to benefit from. And first and foremost, a city where you can trust that your elected officials are being held to the highest ethical standards and who face real consequences when they violate the public trust. It's a city that you would choose even if you could live anywhere else on earth, and that's my standard. And make no mistake, even though politics is focused on the next election in the short term, future success and today's prosperity go hand in hand. We cannot have one without the other, and all you have to do is sit in traffic to realize that. My campaign is based on uh, the same kind of independent leadership you've come to know from me. Uh, I am an independent. So my campaign will be focused on those big issues that we can tackle together to move our city forward. Not partisan politics, not wedge issues that grab headlines but don't move us forward, and certainly not the bombast that you've been hearing far too much from elected officials. It is simply those issues that we can work on together to make sure that you have a great community, a city you can be proud of no matter where you live, no matter what you do, no matter what your last name is, but a city that we can all be proud to leave our children and our grandchildren. Thank you very much. I see that Mr. Medina has joined us, uh, even though I have been told that he would be able to. Uh, I think that in, uh, in, in fairness to, uh, uh, to the process and the citizens, I, I would say that uh, in not membership, uh, that we need to have a vote of the membership as to whether Mr. Medina can participate in the process or not. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those in opposed say nay. You may participate, Mr. Medina. You will have three minutes for opening comments. After that, we will be going to two-minute response to questions in order to fit uh, the timing in. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Ron, you got here in a hurry. We were having an event a minute ago, and you got here real quick. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Ron Wood Medina. I'm a successful businessman, a dedicated family man, and a man of faith. I graduated from the University of Texas at Austin with a master's degree in electrical engineering. Once I graduated, I returned to San Antonio and I got to work. Over the last 20 years, I've managed three successful businesses. The first, a call center technology and infrastructure company that began with five employees and blossomed to 500 employees. I've also managed a political consulting company that clients across the state, throughout the nation, no, and even internationally. Yes, of late, I run a real estate company, mainly managing properties uh, that I own. And uh, the truth is, my wife does uh, most of the work, and I'm just trying to take a little bit of the credit. Uh, so I'm a successful businessman, uh, dedicated family man. I've known my wife, Jeanette, for over 20 years. We live with our daughters, Michelle Marie and Sada Sophia, here on the north side in the Dominion. I like to tell people that uh, I wasn't born in the Dominion, but I certainly worked hard, studied hard, Played by the rules and got there as soon as I could. I'm a man of faith. I pray every night, and I believe that the Virgen de Guadalupe, the patron, the patron saint of the Americas, got over me and not my campaign. When it comes to the city of San Antonio, there are three fundamental reasons why I'm running. We need a mayor that's independent of special interest. We need a mayor that's focused on today, and we need a mayor that will be the voice for fiscal responsibility. When it comes to independence, well, the truth is we have a pay-to-play culture at City Hall, where candidates get their contributions, special interests get their special favors, and taxpayers get stuck with the bill. We need to address that, we need to address it now. There's a legitimate concern in the community that uh, this council pays too much attention to tomorrow, that they talk about the million people coming to San Antonio over the next 25 years, their jobs, their infrastructure, their safety. Well, how about the 1.5 million that are here today? Our jobs, our safety, our infrastructure. And no one expects the, the mayor to solve these problems overnight, but they do want a mayor who starts today. And when it comes to fiscal responsibility, everyone will tell you they didn't increase their tax rate, but you saw your appraisals rise and your tax bill rise. So my standing rule will be, 
that if your appraisal rises, your tax rate will go down. I will challenge every saw and CPS rate increase, because I believe that we already have too many six-figure salaries and pet projects at City Hall. I will rein in the Bear County Appraisal District, and I'll tell you how we move forward on that as we move forward for my time with them. Mayor Taylor, first uh, uh, response to a question. Each of you will have three minutes. What I would ask is Mayor, two minutes, I'm sorry, uh, now to get out of here in time. Uh, Mayor Taylor, and then Ron Nurnberg, and then uh, Mr. Medina. Uh, we will then reverse the order so that we have as little uh, movement as necessary. Okay. And obviously, we had quite a lot of questions and had to combine some. Some were a little too broad to answer in a short amount of time, and some were too specific um, in, in their request. So um, they've been broken down in categories. The first one is governance. Mayor Taylor, Taylor Nod has always been a champion of ethical, open, and transparent government. What will you do to improve transparency, and how do you intend to strengthen the ethics review board? Do you support changing the city charter to provide for an auditor who reports to the board rather than the city council or city staff? I certainly understand that uh, how critical it is for our citizens to have trust in their local government. Uh, I'm open to look, looking at uh, what the structure should be for the ethics review board and the possibility of uh, us having um, someone who would be viewed as more independent as far as an ethics officer. However, I do also feel strongly that uh, ethics is not something that can be legislated uh, and that you have to be very careful in setting up these boards because oftentimes they have focus on a gotcha mentality instead of uh, serving as a resource uh, for the folks who have um, been elected to govern. So I definitely believe that there's a balance. I certainly ask folks to very carefully consider the um, the uh, people that they are looking at elected both electing both for the mayor and the city council see what their backgrounds are, uh, what their records show, um, their personal integrity, all those things I think is very important for people to thoughtfully uh, consider while we also look at how we can improve the structure and systems that we have in place so that we can ensure that we have the confidence of the citizenry. Well, I think this is a vital conversation for the sole reason that we know where San Antonio was in 2002 and 2003 as we were watching members of council being pulled off in, in uh, handcuffs. We don't want to get back to that. And the fact of the matter is there is a direct correlation between accountability and public confidence and how many people actually turn out to vote. Uh, so this is an extremely important issue, which is why I champion uh, issues of or uh, measures to improve transparency at City Hall. It's also why I've been very forceful with the improvement of the ethics code to give it real teeth and to give an ethics auditor who is independent. The Ethics Review Board, for instance, needs to, for instance, needs to be autonomous and independent from the City Council and the City staff. It is charged with overseeing. Otherwise, the public doesn't have confidence that the process works. We also need to make sure that the Ethics Review Board has sanction authority to deliver the kinds of uh, punishment, sanctions, that are necessary to give the Ethics Code uh, teeth. Since my time on council, I've worked very hard to make sure that we have more accessibility and transparency within our processes. One of the first things I did as a member of council was to bring our work sessions where policy making is actually done by council to broadcast and webcast so people can watch. And uh, not necessarily that you all want to watch that stuff, it's not that interesting or high drama, but it's important that your elected officials know that it's being recorded that there's a record of what they say and what they do. So I think I, I am uh, certainly supportive of it, uh, not open to it. I think it has to happen uh, for the public to have confidence in the working of their council and their elected officials to ensure that we are working in your best interests and those interests alone. Please, uh, if those of you who have just arrived, uh, I was asked, or I asked everyone to not make the comments or applause during the presentation. 
Uh, we certainly need an independent ethics are. Independent with the authority to file public corruption charges as well. I've outlined a seven point plan on how do we address this on my website, uh, medinaforessaymayor.com. But this is an issue not because of things that happened 10, 15 years ago. It's because of issues that are happening today. Under this council, we've had three corruption scandals over the last three, four years. We had a deputy city manager negotiating his job at the same time bidding out a $305 million contract with a company that ultimately won the contract and which was actually got him the job he was looking for. That's the problem today. We have a mayor, with all due respect, that was involved in what they call the Ivy Taylor housing scandal related to Section 8 housing and how she was benefiting from that as well. But nothing happened. No reprimand. Just a month ago, we had the issue of the barge contract. A process that began six months ago where companies competed and at the last moment, the whole process was taken down because of issues that the mayor had yet to outline. To this day, we still don't know why. There's no reprimand. But also, when it comes to the bond, we talk about corruption. There's hard corruption. There's soft corruption. The appointment of people with conflict of interest to, to these committees is, a, is corruption. And I, don't, I won't go too far. Phil Harbor Park, three board members were appointed by the councilman to the committee that was looking at how this, they were going to dole out $100 million in parks money. I'm sure they reviewed all the proposals across town. But at the end of the day, these three individuals voted for $15,000 for the Harvard Party. That's soft corruption, too. Our next question is, cities can choose to employ either a strong city manager or a strong mayor council form of government. Which form do you support and why? The one we have today. Because, in theory, it balances out, right? But what we have today is a city manager that is up here, and here is your elected officials down here. So while both of my friends here on stage are supportive of Cheryl Scully continuing, I'm not. Why? It goes beyond her pay. Yes, she makes more than the president and the governor of the United States combined, but it goes beyond her pay. It goes into her politics. She should be in her office administrating staff, directing departments. But instead, she's on the street, holding rallies, microphone in hand, pushing an agenda. That's not her job. Additionally, to her pay and her politics, well, her accumulation of power. And when someone uh, goes against her wishes, she has the express news to tear them down. She has the chamber to fund other candidates. That's why over the next 20 days, every single day, you'll be an art, you'll read an article with express news against Manuel Medina. That'll be laden with half-truths, false insinuations, because I've been clear that we need a new city manager. My mantra has been May 7th, new mayor, May 8th, excuse me, May 6th, new mayor, May 7th, new city manager. May 8th, we level the playing field in the city of San Antonio so that we can keep the former government that the people want us to have. Additionally, when it comes to Cheryl, I think that she's done some good things over time. Okay? She has. But she's not the only one that can do that. And the truth is, if we talk about term limits for council, term limits for mayor, we should also talk about term limits for city managers. Thank you very much. Well, I, I kind of like the council manager form of government. Uh, and the reason is it helps remove some of the politics out of every day-to-day -day, uh, day decisions, day-to-day -day operational decisions like contract procurement and so forth. When you have a city manager uh, who is charged with being a good executive to make sure that the operations of the city are sound, 
We tend to have the politics kept where the politics should be, which is policy making. Unfortunately, right now, uh, I think you have a lack of leadership in the mayor's office. And I don't think we need to change the structure of government just because we need a new mayor. Uh, it's very important that we exert our authority as uh, a city council to develop good policy. When there's something going on in the city of San Antonio that you don't like, that you'd like to see changed, usually it points back to bad policymaking, or it needs to be adjusted with policymaking, and that's my position. I know City Manager Scully uh, gets a lot of uh, arrows, uh, especially during political campaigns, but the fact of the matter is this is a two and a half billion dollar budget with 11,000 employees plus. Uh, and while it doesn't make anyone sleep well at night to know that we have public sector employees anywhere making that much money, the fact of the matter is that's what the market bears. And I'll be darned if San Antonio should take second place to anyone. We want the very best. And Cheryl Scully has been the very best. We have a AAA bond rating, which saves you and I money every single day. We are one of the most well-financially managed big cities in the country. In fact, the only big city in the country that has a AAA bond rating. That's important uh, for a community our size. Um, Cheryl Scully has done an excellent job. And when people ask me, you know, what's, uh, you know, how, how do you feel about her pay? You know, I often tell them what Babe Ruth uh, told the reporter when he was asked about uh, him making more money than the president. And Babe Ruth replied, well, it's because I had a better year. Uh, Cheryl Scully it should be credited with a lot of the success that we have in the city. It does not excuse poor policy making, though, because the city council and the mayor are the bosses for the executive team. All right. Well, let me start out by saying that there is no lack of leadership in the mayor's office. Um, I, I think if you look at the issues that I've addressed, streetcar, police contract, dealing with the union, uh, Vista Ridge, even the size of the bond, which I pushed for it to be this large, I think that we can all agree that I have provided strong leadership in the mayor's office. And I actually question why these gentlemen attack me on that particular issue. But in any case, I mentioned that um, I taught um, at UTSA for six years. And so every semester, I would teach the public administration students about the forms of government. So I can talk about both sides. On the side of council manager, certainly it provides continuity of leadership, especially since we have such short terms uh, for the uh, political offices. Uh, it is focused on reducing the political influence on important decisions and does provide for operational and administrative excellence. On the strong mayor side, uh, most of the large cities that have populations over one million people do use the strong mayor form of government, and I think there are probably some reasons for that. In my uh, work in this, in this office and as council member, what I believe is that strong mayor acknowledges the real uh, in an honest way, political um, impact on the policy making process. Having said that, I think that it's something that uh, the citizens should decide, which is why I've been very focused on ensuring that we continue to improve our govern governance by reestablishing a charter commission. That's a topic that the Charter Commission could take up. I certainly uh, have provided the leadership that we need given the form of government that we have and recognize the city manager's role and my, my leadership role as well, not just uh, over the manager, but also working as a team leader with the city council as well. Sure. Our next group of questions is in regard to finances. There is concern about the degree of city oversight of our public utilities. The actions of CPS and SOLS directly impact both rates paid by users and the city budget. How would you ensure SOLS users are fairly billed based on timely, accurate readings and that CPS projects are in the best long-term interest of ratepayers in the city? Thank you for the question. I uh, serve as a member of both the CPS board and the SOLS uh, board, so I have the opportunity to be engaged um, probably more substantively than the council members do on these issues. But in addition to that, we have staff at the uh, city who are very focused on uh, vetting any information that comes to us from the uh, utilities to ensure that we're getting the story straight. So I have confidence in 
uh, the information that we're receiving both from the staffs uh, at the executive leadership staff at CPS and SAWS, as well as the uh, staff that we have at the uh, at uh, City Hall. In addition, we have improved uh, the frequency of the communication between those utilities because there was some frustration that we felt we were mainly being approached when it's time for a rate increase. So we do have uh, regular update sessions from the utilities. And also, um, I uh, transformed one of the council committees uh, to also have an emphasis on utilities so that there's an opportunity for the council members on that committee to also be frequently briefed and engaged uh, with the utilities as well. We recognize how important it is for us to keep those rates as low as possible, and I think we've done a good job. Our rates are amongst the lowest in Texas, but we'll continue to provide the oversight that's necessary and have that uh, constant communication so that we stay on top of what's happening at those utilities. I think one of the um, key motivations is the fact that we, uh, since we own uh, CPS in particular, we own both, but CPS provides a healthy portion of our city budget, so uh, we wouldn't be good fiscal stewards if we weren't keeping on top of what's happening over there. It's an extraordinary question, and by design, the boards of both CPS and SAWS, because they are publicly owned, had a member of the board being the mayor. Um, we have a fiduciary responsibility. Every member of council has a fiduciary responsibility to ensure that both utilities are well managed. And while the uh, position on the board of SAWS and CPS is ex officio, it is an engaged board level member. Um, I plan to be very engaged, as I have been on the issues of CPS and especially SAWS and water security. And I think this is, some, this is an area that needs to drastically improve. improve. Uh, case in point being the handling of Vista Ridge. Um, I had been made, making it very clear that we don't have the, the SAWS, the board of SAWS and the, the board of CPS need to understand that our goals are slightly different at CPS, the board level, and city council. Um, we need to ensure that both of us see eye to eye in the sense that the mission of SAWS and the mission of CPS is to make sure that we are delivering water in an affordable manner. Um, with regard to Vista Ridge, um, this is a clear example of what I don't think is going well right now. Um, we have several changes made to the council, to the contract for Vista Ridge that uh, have been done without council consent that create a situation where it is less confident, where we have less confidence that the pipe in the ground is going to deliver water at the end of the day. Uh, changes that are made to accelerate the, con the construction of the pipeline. This is a very concerning matter when we have a mayor who does not inform council when these contract changes are made. Uh, these are very important decisions because when it comes down to uh, the responsibilities of council for both CPS and both uh, both CPS and SAWS, our job is to make sure that they are delivering affordable and effective services to the citizens of San Antonio. As I stated in my opening statement, I will challenge every single SAWS and CPA. CPS rate increase because we already have too many six-figure salaries at City Hall and too many pet projects. In fact, whenever SAWS or CPS asks for a 1% increase, I'm going to challenge them and will not approve it unless they find 1% savings in efficiencies. We need to look out after the taxpayer because when it comes to CPS, lately they've been installing these uh, smart meters that uh, putting aside privacy issues, uh, putting aside whether they're measuring correctly or too much, just the cost of its implementation has been an issue. In theory, it was going to cost A, for example, but in reality, numbers show that's going to be two times A. So it's an issue because Special Interest Act, CPS, pushed it through the CPS board and council. I've got an issue with that. Because all of a sudden now, they have enough money to buy a $120 million headquarters. But they say it's not going to cost anything. 
I wish they told me how so I could give one too. When it comes to SAWS, this $3.4 billion pipeline that both people here next to me voted twice for. Now that we're in the campaign season, well, only one of them is for it. The other one, all of a sudden, has problems with it. It was fast-tracked on council. It was fast-tracked on council. And as a result of these two individuals not doing their homework, six months into the contract, the finance company went bankrupt. There again, special interests get their special favors, candidates get their contributions, and taxpayer, at the end of the day, gets stuck with the bill. Our next question is, given the growing concern about San Antonio's long-term debt, what other mechanisms can be employed to provide resources to fund the ongoing needs of the city? When it comes to our finances, we have a $2.4 billion budget, $1.1 million general fund. The biggest uh, uh, component of that income has to do with CPS revenue. The second one has to do with property taxes, the third sales, and the other one, a series of other C's and, and others. Well, on the table, just so you know, half of what you pay in property taxes, the city, go to pay down the local debt. That means previous bonds. We have a bond on the table. If you want to do something about your debt, your property tax debt today, then you can simply vote no. Because what this debt, this bond is going to do is at $850 million to our local debt. And it's a shame because there's some good stuff in there that we need to address. I mean, $650 million that address the sidewalks and streets, that helps with maintenance, libraries, and parks drainage and flood control. But let me share it with you. Stuff people don't know. This bond also has $200 million in debt projects. Now we need to question ourselves, what were our elected officials thinking? $50 million to beautify Broadway. I mean, Broadway looks pretty nice already. And all they're going to do is tear down two lanes. It's going to create even traffic. But they want to beautify Broadway because there's a lot of special interest in town that want to make sure that they win off that. Zachary Corporation is going to get $25 million to build a hotel on Hemisphere Park. They want to build it? Great. But why do we have to pay for it? Then we have $15 million, with all due respect, to Phil Harburger Park and where we're at today. Do we really need to spend $15 million on a land bridge? Do we need to give UTSA $10 million so they can build a gym on campus? You already have an ice cream. And take a step back. UTSA is part of the UT system one of the wealthiest universities in the world, and we're going to give them $10 million. So we're serious about property values, property tax revenue. Well, this is something we could vote yes or no for. Given growing concern about San Antonio's long-term debt, what other mechanisms can be employed to provide resources to fund the ongoing needs of the city? Well, I think some of this is a little bit of red meat from people who don't understand where we are financially. San Antonio is doing very well on debt service management, and that's one of the reasons why we have such a strong credit rating. That's one of the reasons why it's, it's not difficult, it's not easy to talk about, but the performance of city management has to do with how they manage our finances, and they've been doing a very good job of that, uh, to the uh, envy of many major cities in the United States. Uh, I think one area where we can improve uh, the management of money, though, is at the homeowner level. Uh, we know that in three weeks you're going to get your property tax assessment. Uh, and while we can't look for you know fancy shining objects that give you you know seven dollars on average of relief and call that relief, that's what Senate Bill Two will do. Uh, we have to look for actual meaningful relief. Uh, you may remember in 2013 the council had an opportunity. Or, or the council took an opportunity to add a $1 per month uh, fee to your CPS bill and call it an environmental services fee because we are uh, short $7 million to take care of some things in the general fund. I voted no because that amounted to a regressive tax. We have to keep ourselves from uh, being persuaded to do those things when we can do better within living within our means of the current budget. And I also think we need to be using our city's voice uh, to push for meaningful appraisal reform. We have to start appraising properties uh, for what they're worth and not what the government thinks it needs. 
fairness in appraisals so that you can be sure that when you go and get you get your appraisal um, that you are being treated the same as any other neighbor, a commercial neighbor or a residential neighbor. Um, in addition to that, we also have to work with our legislature uh, to address meaningful school finance reform. That is the bulk of what is hitting your tax bill. And without a focused effort on that, uh, we are not going to see relief uh, for homeowners in San Antonio. In answer to the question, I'll say that we can and will pursue federal and state grants to help us pay for infrastructure. I think we're all eager to see um, what the new administration is really going to provide as they voice that they're interested in infrastructure. So certainly we'll pursue those dollars. However, the question implies that um, we're somehow in a shaky position in relation to our debt management, and I certainly would reject that notion. We are very, very far below what the state cap is on what we can borrow. We borrow just a fraction of what we're allowed to. And in relation to the bond program, I would just uh, underscore how important and critical this bond program is for our community. It allows us to uh, provide basic infrastructure, streets so that we can improve traffic and flow, drainage so that we can get homes out of floodplains, sidewalks so that uh, kids can have a sidewalk to walk to school, in addition to other projects that enhance the quality of life like parks and libraries. Uh, and we're doing that without a property tax rate increase. And because of the city's uh, credit rating, we're able to borrow at the lowest interest rates possible, which means that we're able to invest the maximum amount of dollars from the bond program into actual projects. So you're getting more bang for your buck on the projects. So again, we're in a strong financial position, and I don't have any qualms about as far as $850 million dollars. Uh, in, in investing in our community because I believe that will allow a platform for our, our city's future economic growth. How does San Antonio meet the future demands of the police and fire department union contracts without raising property taxes? Okay, that is an excellent question. So, uh, we uh, began on this journey, I guess, probably about three years ago to uh, renegotiate contracts for police and fire. We do have a new contract uh, for police. Uh, for fire, we don't have a contract yet. They were very reluctant to come to the table and did not do so for uh, quite some time. What we're able to do uh, with the negotiation that occurred with the police department is actually to adjust the health insurance options uh, that are provided so that we were able to save $87.5 million over five years with the health care um, option uh, where officers are now sharing in the cost of uh, health care for their families. So that was really uh, our major policy goal to achieve because we knew that for the future as health care costs continue to uh, escalate and we're, as we're in an uncertain environment in relation to health care that we wanted to adjust that so that we could plan for the future and our, our hope and our goal is to do the same thing uh, for the fire uh, department as well. So we do need to have uh, take a critical look at um, you know, what level of service is provided, what, where we see other increase in costs may occur in the future, and uh, continue to budget appropriately. But at the end of the day, we have to have a growing economy so that we can continue to pay for, for the services um, that are needed. And um, at the risk of, I guess, sounding flip also, uh, those hot summers, they help us too because uh, CPS kicks in a little bit into the general fund. Uh, so, I mean, there are many factors that will contribute to the size of the budget, uh, but we do our best to uh, provide strong fiscal management so that we'll be able to accommodate that need for continued public safety. Well, I have to disagree with the mayor on this, um, primarily because hope is not a plan. Um, the goal of the contract negotiation was not better health care or more uh, payment into health care. That is something we achieved. It was one of the ways we were trying to achieve the goal. The goal was to 
uh, strike a contract agreement that was structurally balanced. Currently, in the city of San Antonio, our expenses in public safety are growing far faster than the city's revenues. And that creates a situation with the old contract that we were headed towards increasing amounts from the general fund having to be used uh, for public safety expenses. The same thing exists today. Uh, when the mayor ended the mediation and struck a contract, um, it is now going to be $20 million over budget by year five. That is structurally imbalanced. It's going, to, it's going to be a challenge to overcome that and do what we need to do with public safety, which is to right-size the department. We have one of the lower capita, lower per capita officers, officers per capita of major cities in the United States. That will continue to be a challenge with our crime rate. That will continue to be a challenge when we have to uh, manage policing from one crisis to another crisis, when we have to move resources away, when we see property crime outbreaks in other property parts of town. We need to make sure that we have a contract that is structurally balanced so we can continue to grow the department the way it ought to. Uh, with regard to doing that, how do we get more revenue? Well, we have to approach the negotiation with a clear sense of what that objective is, which is what we were trying to do. And, and again, uh, we have to begin that negotiation now because we know how challenging it was uh, with regard to this contract negotiation to even get people to speak the same language. We have to begin to approach the next contract negotiation now because the objective is to achieve structural balance. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, that our general fund, which is where we pay for public safety, is approximately $1.1 billion. And approximately 66% of that fund is going to fund public safety operations. And uh, I think that's, it, it should go there. Because we have some basic city functions to provide, core functions, if you will, for the police, fire, and street maintenance. So it should uh, be the lion's share of the general fund. I've been very clear that I will balance our budget. I will keep it in the $1.1 billion range, but I won't do it on the back of the fire and police. I simply won't do it because that's our number one responsibility. We need to go in there and look at what else we can cut first, whether it's some of these six-figure salaries or whether it's some of these pet projects, but we need to do that first. We do that, we show good faith. We go to the table with, with fire and say, look, this is what we're willing to cut. Where can we meet halfway? The problem with the whole negotiation from the very beginning is that there was no good face on behalf of the mayor. Police came to the table looking to strike a deal that worked for them and worked for the city. But next thing you know, they were being characterized in the media as public enemy number one. They were being, they were, the, the mayor was negotiating their contract in the media. As a result, police had to take a step back and take a win-win uh, off the table and win for me situation only. That's what got us to the contract we have today. And we still have the fire contract before us. Well, we need to take a step back, sit down with fire and tell them, look, we'll meet you halfway. We're willing to cut here, we're willing to cut there, because public safety is our number one priority. Where can you meet us halfway? So good faith negotiations is what we have not had. Good faith negotiations is where we need to go. The next group of questions is on neighborhoods, environment, and transit. As the city moves towards increasing housing density, what are your views on increasing impervious cover and providing parks, natural areas, and green spaces? How would you provide, propose funding the maintenance and services of the city? Well, you, you mentioned transit, and, and uh, I associate transportation with that. I've said that from the very beginning, that I'm going to be the transportation mayor. As transportation mayor, I've outlined five specific items. But first, we're going to take the top 50 quarters in the city and improve drive times by 10% in the first six months. Secondly, we will actually fund the Rey Saldana Via Amendment, resolution that is, where we were providing $10 million so that we can expand routes and increase frequency. Therefore, more people are on the bus, that's people out in the highway, that's people polluting our community. Additionally, well, we talked about working with businesses to incentivize them on 
how incent provide incentives so that more of their employees work from home, how they can uh, let their employees out outside of peak hours, come in outside of peak hours, so we can address traffic and congestion. And then we've also talked about uh, building rail from San Antonio to Austin, but rail that actually gets built. Because for the last 10 years, we've talked about it, and we've gotten nowhere. We need a mayor that will take a leadership role on this issue. A mayor that will say they're ready to build it. A mayor who will go out with our partners and tell them we're going to put our fair share on the table as well, unlike it's happened in the past. And a specific timeline, budget, and pass within the first year that I'm mayor. Additionally, we go out with the federal government, try to identify federal grants and loans to finance the project. Additionally, go out to the state, find resources we have there, and then complement it with public funding. So yes, it'll be a P3. And as we move forward, when it comes to transportation financing it, we're going to do so by transportation economies that develop, not with the taxpayer resource revenue we have today. Since, since you were addressing transit, that was really a group of questions that it was category. So I'll go ahead with my next question that does have to do with transit. That way we'll hear about transit from all three of you uh, at the same time. What can be done in short and long term to reduce traffic congestion and improve air quality? Do you support toll roads and what other forms of transit do you see as viable for our city? I was really getting excited to answer the previous corporate question. We're back. We're back. <laughs> Transportation is probably the top infrastructure challenge of our time. Uh, we're adding 150 cars to our roads every single day, uh, and we simply do not have the space or the money to do all the capacity building that we would like to do. My plan for transportation is to focus on the major bottlenecks first to address where we can add capacity that will help with that traffic relief. Uh, but beyond that, we have to actually leverage a multimodal transportation system. We have many elements of that multimodal system already in place, voter approved. The first one is the Greenway Trail system. Uh, we have to continue to watch that expand and, 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 and allow that to expand to the point where it's not just one path to a park, from a park to a park, but also is an option for people to get from a neighborhood to a community center or from a workplace to a school and so forth. We have to advance uh, the uh, safe bike routes, the bicycle master plan for the city of San Antonio and build safe bike routes around town, not just painting stripes on roads like we see on Wurzbach, but actually make safe bike lanes possible in San Antonio so people have the option. We have to continue to, walk, to move forward on Vision Zero so that people can use the original mode of transportation, which is using your feet, to move from one place to another as an option. And then ultimately, San Antonio has to build a modern transportation system for the city of San Antonio. I support a mass transit system for the city of San Antonio because we have a citizen-driven one in the SA Tomorrow plan, the comprehensive multimodal transportation plan that I was proud to chair for 18 months. Now we need to make sure it is voter approved. We know where the routes need to go. All 13 of those activity areas where high density commercial residential activity is happening all around town. We just need to put a plan in place and implement that plan and it will require a vote to do that and I plan to give you that vote. Implementation of our SA Tomorrow plan really is going to be critical in order for us to plan for the future growth and to manage congestion in the future. It includes a transportation component, and so I, I am looking forward to us moving forward on uh, implementation of that plan, which includes as one of its key ideas uh, the idea of creating regional centers where people live, work, and play, so that hopefully we can have nodes where people can um, achieve and accomplish their their daily activities without always having to take long trips on the expressway. Of course, we have to continue to advocate for uh, dollars from the state and federal government in order to expand lane capacity on our roads, but I don't think ultimately that that will get us out of congestion because I think more cars will go on the road. But again, we have to make it easier for people to be able to accomplish their daily activities, maybe outside of the car, and also take shorter trips. On a personal note, you know, I reflect on my own experience. I uh, live on the near east side, and I live 
less than three miles from our place of employment, and my husband does as well. That's a conscious choice that we've made. I think if we can make the inner city more attractive for more families, then that means we don't we have less families moving out into the area where there's already strain and uh, congestion. Uh, and then finally, we have to improve our public transit system uh, via Metropolitan Transit, which is structurally underfunded. That's a tough topic that we as a community need to uh, tackle and figure out how we can get VIA to be able to expand and be the modern system that we need. Um, development is a priority, has been a priority, and it's something that we need to continue to stay focused on, uh, encouraging alternative development uh, methods that are environmentally friendly, making it easier through our development code for people to actually employ those methods. We're going to be having a review of our unified development code coming up in the next couple of years, and I think those are issues that we need to look at closely as they certainly um, impact our environment. SA Tomorrow does have a sustainability uh, component within the plan, which I think is important to a lot of these issues as well. But on the issue of parks, that is um, something I feel very strongly about. We need to ensure that folks in every part of San Antonio can uh, have access to open space in order for us to continue uh, to be able to develop those and manage them. We will have to get creative as far as looking at uh, public-private partnerships and um, to a certain extent getting the philanthropic community to provide more support for our parks as well. Uh, last year I went to a conference in Houston which I just can't believe has turned into a green city. They have this huge uh, project to redevelop the bayous but they have tremendous support from the philanthropic community that has allowed them to position themselves in that way. And that's an area where I would like to <coughs> dig in. And so in my initial conversations, the impression is that the philanthropic community here feels that it's just a city responsibility maintenance of parks. But in order for us to have that wonderful city um, that we aspire to and have parks in every single part of the community, I believe we will need to have a strong partnership in order to be able to support and maintain those parks for the future. I think we need to get serious about a smarter development pattern in the city of San Antonio and make sure our policies reflect that. Um, sprawl has created challenges for the entire community from our infrastructure to our public services to our public safety. Um, and when we have an opportunity to build a comprehensive plan, a sustainability plan, I want it to be as strong on those issues as possible. And that's what got uh, the mayor and myself into a little bit of a conflict. I think it could have been a stronger plan. Granted, now we have a plan. It's a good plan. But the plan is only good as the paper it's written on if we don't implement it. And so I've been very clear on the decisions that are made at the Zoning and Planning Commission with regard to impervious cover situations with the Unified Development Code on the strength of our dark skies and our impervious cover policies. We need to be as strong as possible to make sure that we have less growth in the areas that is unsustainable and we encourage more growth growth in the places that it is. I want to do a top-down review of development policies and regulations to ensure that we turn the page on a system of development that makes it more profitable for people to do green space development in the areas of sprawl and less profitable to do it in the urban core where we actually want to see it happen. We also have a dearth of affordable housing. Like I said, the average family in San Antonio can no longer afford the average home in San Antonio. And the answer is not incentives and tax abatements to change that. The answer is to make sure that we have development in these sustainable areas that is more profitable to do. When the private sector sees a market for the kind of growth and development that we want to see in our San Antonio areas, that's when it will happen. And that's how I think we create a smarter development community for our city. This has been something we've been talking about on the campaign trade a lot. I mean, uh, about SA tomorrow. Well, what I've tried to do is refocus the conversation on SA today. Because there are real issues that citizens face today. Crime, which has skyrocketed over the last year. Poverty, 20% of the people here in San Antonio live in poverty. When it comes to uh, basic infrastructure, we have issues today 
at your traffic that's here today. So when we've had this conversation of what today and tomorrow, I always try to bring it back to today. But when it comes to essay to model the plan, there's there's certainly a number of very good ideas. There's no specific projects in there. There's objectives, but there's no specific projects. But some of those ideas certainly pit competing interests, like the councilman just said, the components of the dark skies, the pervious covers, restrictions of building over the Edwards Aquifer, a number of environmentally sensitive uh, issues that, that, that were included in, uh, in, in the essay tomorrow. Lots of people came together, put this in. But then these issues were stripped once they came to committee that council, because special interests run these committees. Special interests are the ones who, uh, at the end of the day, get their way. So we need to do something about that, and I think we need to do that about today. When it comes to green spaces, when it comes to specific development, uh, certainly we need to share in the benefits uh, of growth, and we need to spread it across, not just on the north side, we need to find ways to spread it across the county. Uh, but that way we share in the challenges, in the challenges of growth, whether it's traffic, whether it's housing, or just uh, pressure on our environment. So sharing the challenges and the benefits uh, is how we address this issue, and when it comes to funding, I mean, you use it, you build it, you pay for it. Uh, so that we can ensure that all of the candidates have time to give us some closing statements, this will be our last. Question. Neighborhoods throughout the city have expressed that they are being ignored or neglected by city ordinances and actions. How can communications to and input from neighborhoods be improved prior to council action? Well, first of all, we need a new city manager. Because when this city manager came to San Antonio, she scrapped all our neighborhood plans. Neighborhood associations uh, would get together, design a master plan for their neighborhood, and then they would submit it to the city, and then that would be the next step in having a master plan. But when this city manager came to San Antonio, she scrapped all of that, and she put neighborhood associations aside. That has been one of the criticisms of this essay tomorrow. I know people participate, but one of the major criticisms of essay tomorrow is that neighborhood associations, homeowner associations, groups within the community didn't have enough say in this development. So what we need to do, frankly speaking, is get a new city manager. And this really cuts to the heart of quality of life because, it, like I said, it is those individual decisions that make or break a community, that make or break a neighborhood. Um, as I have done as a District 8 Council member, we have expanded the responsibilities of our office to reach out to neighborhoods that are going to be impacted by zoning and planning commissions. Right now, there's a 200-foot radius rule that if your neighborhood is within a 200-foot radius of an application, you're notified by, by city staff. We have told zoning applications you have to notify everyone in an area, uh, anyone who is going to be impacted, because we all know we have to live with those impacts. Um, in addition to that, I think that the Zoning and Planning Commission, uh, we need to do a review of the seats on those commissions, as I have supported. Uh, we need to make sure that they are a balance of interest, that we don't have just the industries that are going to be, that are going to be benefiting from or, um, you know, being subject to those applications, be part of those boards and commissions. We need to make sure that there is a balance of interest and perspective on those boards and commissions. Um, in addition to that, uh, this is something not just for those committee meetings, but also for city council in general. We do have to look at the timing of these meetings. Uh, many times, a, if you have a zoning application, and I remember what happened here at Harvard Park with Walmart, that was a big deal for, the, for a community. It was a hyper-local issue, uh, maybe didn't reach the radar of most uh, city council members, but that's a big deal for anybody that has to live in the neighborhood who wants to come to the park. We need to make sure that when there are those meetings that are happening, they're scheduled at the time that people who are at work can go to them. Um, to me, it doesn't make any sense that, you know, in, in the middle of the afternoon, in the middle of a work day, you're going to schedule a planning or a zoning commission when the, the folks that are really going to be impacted have to be at work. Um, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So I, I believe that there needs to be a 
review of all the procedures uh, with regard to the zoning and planning process to ensure that, that uh, the citizens who are going to be impacted are able to be part of the process. Well, this certainly is a very critical issue. I started out by thanking you all for the many hours that I know you spend working to ensure quality of life in your neighborhoods. I do believe that we can do a better job at the city as far as our outreach to neighborhood associations, and that's why I pushed the city manager to recreate a department that would be focused on uh, neighborhoods and neighborhood services. When I was a city employee, I worked for such a department. It was called Neighborhood Action. Some of you may remember the Neighborhood Suites program and some of the other outreach that we had. So the manager has um, recreated a department that she's titled Housing and Neighborhood Services, and I think it has the opportunity to really uh, provide a great portal and point of contact for neighborhood associations, and I'm looking forward to shaping uh, how that department will communicate with citizens. As part of the SHMR implementation, one of the things that I'm extremely excited about is the fact that um, we'll be convening a huge neighborhood conference next year. And so uh, I'm looking forward to that as an opportunity uh, to learn more about what the challenges are that face neighborhood associations and figure out how we can better engage with the city, especially in relation to implementation of SA tomorrow. I always encourage my council colleagues to have strong communication through their offices. They're uh, a key communication point for neighborhood association as well. And we do tend to focus down at City Hall on using digital resources to reach out to folks, social media and the like. But I also think it's very important that we don't forget that there are folks out there who don't use those resources and sometimes a good old-fashioned uh, phone call uh, really can mean the difference um, as far as a group being informed of what's going on versus not. So you have my commitment that I will continue to uh, work to improve communication. Mayor Taylor, uh, it is time to have closing remarks. Uh, officially, we, we really want to thank you and, and uh, Ron Nurnberg and Emmanuel Medina to, uh, uh, for coming this evening and sharing with us. But uh, um, uh, Mayor Taylor, if you would share your closing comments in the next three minutes. Sure. Well, thank you again for uh, taking time out of your schedules to be, um, to learn about the candidates that are running uh, for mayor. I am asking for your support to allow me to continue to provide strong leadership uh, for our city council and for our city. Um, as I mentioned to you, I come really well prepared for the job, and I think that those skills that I bring to bear will be particularly important for us at this time because we know that there is going to be a changeover in many of the council seats as some of the uh, candidates have chosen not to run again and some folks are term limited. We will have at least four new council members, and so I believe it's important for us to have a steady hand in leadership down at City Hall because there are still many important issues that uh, face us. I believe if you look at my record, you cannot challenge the fact that I have provided strong leadership. I, I don't, you know, have a problem if folks have a differing vision of, you know, where the city should go, but there's no denying that I have provided leadership on issues, um, again, ranging from the water supply to planning for tomorrow, even as we deal with the challenges of today, to really focusing on how we can ensure that all San Antonians are connected to opportunity. We didn't talk about it much tonight, but workforce development is something that I'm extremely passionate about because I believe that's going to be the, uh, what will make San Antonio stand out for the future, ensuring that we have a workforce that's prepared for jobs that are being created every single day in our city, and ensuring that people who have bypassed the K-16 through educational pipeline have the opportunity to reconnect to skills development and short-term training that will allow them to qualify uh, for these jobs. And I've been working diligently with many partners, including Alamo Colleges and, um, and others others, the private industry, in order to create a system where everyone um, can be connected. And as far as the special interests down at City Hall, let me tell you, 
The special interest that I have is the citizens in every single corner of the city of San Antonio living in neighborhoods where they enjoy a strong quality of life and where they can be connected to opportunities for prosperity. That's what I work towards every single day when I go down to City Hall. I know who I answer to. I know that I'm accountable to the citizens of San Antonio. Uh, believe me, I'm not down there trying to focus on, on anything else. So I am asking that you would um, uh, support me in my bid to continue providing uh, leadership for our community so that we can deal with the challenges that come with the growth that we are experiencing here in our wonderful city. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being out here tonight and, and, to, uh, uh, and for inviting me to join you. Uh, I'm still the, neighbor, the same neighbor uh, who was walking around these streets uh, trying to make the community a better place when I was an HOA board member up here. I'm still the same neighbor who is trying to look for ways that I can be more involved to make our community a better place. I've enjoyed being your city councilman in District 8. We've gotten into some pretty tough battles together. Uh, and I'll tell you that, uh, you know, I, it's not lost on me that people are calling me ambitious. The truth of the matter is, I am very ambitious about the future of the city because I think we deserve to have a great city. A city that you can be confident that a good paying job is waiting for you or your family. A place where you know when you get out on the road you're not stuck in gridlock because we've done our jobs as leaders to build a modern transportation system. A place where you're not sitting in fear of crime that is on the rise as it is today. A place where you know that you can trust the elected officials who are asking for your vote and that we see our neighbors and, and, uh, and people in all parts of town voting in higher numbers because they have the confidence that those elected leaders have delivered. That's my vision of San Antonio and I don't make any apologies about it. I also am very bold about the decisions that we make that make or break that vision on a daily basis. Some of the biggest scrapes I've gotten into are in the battles that I've had to stand alone are ones that defend neighborhoods. And I make no apologies about that too, because I think what people want, whether it's in the city of San Antonio, the state of Texas, or anywhere in this country, is leadership that will stand with the average citizen. That's what I'm about. Uh, I do that because I get home and I get the one true test I get every single day from my son. And to the extent that I can look him in the eye and say that as the, you know, when I had the opportunity to make a difference in my community in an elected position, I didn't think about politics. I just thought about what's the right side of the issue to stand on, and I stood on it. Uh, I will be a happy man. And so far, this has been uh, the job that I've been uh, very proud to have, and has been ma it has made me a happy man because I know we were working to build a greater San Antonio for us all. My vision is very clear. I want to make sure that no matter who you are, no matter what area of town you live in, no matter what you do for a living, you can be a, you can have confidence that we are delivering a great San Antonio that is fiscally responsible, that is one that you can be proud that you leave your children and your grandchildren. Uh, thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, I do invite you to join me if you want to learn more about our campaign and our vision. It's at votebroad.com. Please come and join us for a Saturday or Sunday block walk. Please come and, and meet our team. It's a phenomenal team, and I look forward to being your next mayor. Thank you very much. Let me first thank you for the invitation uh, to be with you, Hall, this evening. Uh, you may not know, but there are actually 14 candidates are running for mayor, and uh, being uh, the three invited, I'm just glad I made the first cut. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ron and I are very good people, and they care about a lot about the city of San Antonio. So do I. We just have a difference of opinion on very critical issues. When it comes to fire and police, I want to balance our budget, but not on their backs. When it comes to Senate Bill 2, that limits the growth of local government, I support it, they oppose it. When it comes to taxpayers, I believe we need to rein in the very county appraisal district, challenge every solid and CPS rate increase. Well, they simply have it. I'm opposed to maxing out our city's credit card. We're borrowing $850 million. Under our current structure, our current tax rate and financial situation, that's the most we can borrow. If we want to borrow more, we can, but it's just going to increase taxes. But under our current financial situation, we're maxing out the city's credit card. 
like you getting a credit card in the mail for three thousand dollars for J.C. Penney. Then the same day, running to J.C. Penney and buying yourself two thousand dollars worth of clothes. Might need a lot of clothes, but it would be physically responsible. Same thing here. We have a lot of needs, but it is not fiscally responsible to max out our city's credit card. When it comes to Vista Rich, three point four billion dollar project. That at the end of the day, we're going to get if we get water. We're going to get the most expensive water in America. Saab themselves said this project was not good, and they wanted to instead invest in desalinization plants. But no, special interest ruled the day, and therefore, in six fast track contract from City Council, and we have this project whose financier went bankrupt in six months. I pulled the toll roads, I pulled the HOV lanes. We're going to have an HOV lane from uh, here in District 8, just in, in, in a matter of a year and a half. Well, I don't support HOV lanes, and I think they're the first step towards the toll roads. Then the day, y'all, I my one million. And as mayor, I will fight independent leadership. Let's focus on today, who will be a voice for fiscal responsibility. I respectfully ask for your vote. I also respectfully ask that you join our movement, because we're building a coalition of Democrats and Republicans across the city. Wouldn't have you seen a proud Democrat like myself be endorsed by the leadership of the Tea Party and Republican leaders like Carlton Souls? It's because we're coming together because we've had enough. In City Hall, there are Democrats and Republicans who are gaining the system and stacking the deck. Well, it's incumbent on Democrats and Republicans outside to come together, challenge the status quo, and address the issues that need to be addressed in the best fiscal manner possible. Thank you. Again, I want to thank the candidates for coming this evening and, and uh, their commitment to public service for our community. Without them, my, uh, we would be a, really in bad shape and, and, and a great loss. I would encourage you as not members to take in, go to their websites, uh, continue to have dialogue with them so that you're prepared to go to the polls and you make a, a knowledgeable, valuable decision. I would also encourage you to, uh, uh, to contact your neighbors and friends to help inform them, help them to become more educated on the candidates themselves and get them to the polls. I want to thank uh, the NOD members for submitting questions this evening. We had a lot of them. I also want to thank the, the, the three uh, board members that assisted with the questions, took care of it really in, in total, uh, to take all of the different questions they got to consolidate them and uh, we got through the majority of them, I think, tonight. I want to uh, thank all of you for your presence. I want to encourage you to, uh, to vote. Early voting is from April 24th through May 2nd, and Election Day, of course, is May 6th. It's very, very important that you get that out there and vote. And I want to thank you and hope that you all have a great evening. I have one comment I must make, though, and that is because it's only fitting that we're we're in Phil Harburger Park. I happen to be very deeply committed to Phil Harburger Park. I keep hearing that the land bridge is going to cost $15 million. That is totally an error. I was part of the bond, Parks Bond Committee that, uh, that negotiated. We, we gave up for $2 million voluntarily to another council district so that they could have money for a needed park there. Uh, so, you know, check out the facts, be aware. I also tell you that I will be over the one uh, SA board. I'm, I'm a speaker for one SA uh, about the bond program. And if you have questions or I can assist in any way with your, your organization to provide information about the bond program or answer your questions, please let me know. Again, thank you very much.